So hello everybody. I'm glad to welcome you uh, to the webinar of on illicit uh, wildlife trade. And before we start, I will say a couple of words about the background. This webinar, uh, uh, this webinar was organized within the activities of cost action, globalization, illicit trade, sustainability, and security. And this particular webinar is held by Working Group One that focuses on the phenomena of, of illicit trade. And my name is Indrek Saar. I'm uh, the leader of this working group. And obviously, I'm chairing this webinar today. Um, uh, today, we have two presentations. And you can ask questions uh, by using chat during the presentations, but also we have like after each presentation, we have these questions and answers round, then you can also ask questions. And uh, we have first presenter is Pedro Cardoso uh, from uh, University of Helsinki, and second presenter is Luis Reina from University of Porto. And now let's, a uh, couple of introduction, the introductory words about Pedro. Um, he is a professor in ecology at the University of Helsinki. He's a conversation biologist working on uh, global drivers on extinction and the distribution of species and communities across space and time. And in this presentation, he overviews current challenges and possible solutions in the field of global wildlife trade. So Pedro, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Indrek, and thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, yeah, to say something about uh, wildlife trade. Uh, my presentation will be, will be quite, um, quite general, because uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a biologist, and I, I'm guessing uh, among us, maybe only Louise is the other biologist, or something related with the uh, wildlife trade. So I'll try to be quite, quite general in my, my presentation, not going into the, the details. Um, but um, as uh, Indrek said, yeah, uh, we, uh, I've been working mostly in in, in, uh, in uh, conservation uh, conservation biology, um, and one of the the, the goals uh, in my uh, research group has been also to uh, look at the, the, the trends of in in in, in uh, wildlife trade across uh, across the the, the globe. Um, so, oh, I have host disabled participant screen sharing. So, I think the host must give me permission to share my screen. Francesco, can you give the permission? Uh, yes. Give me one sec. Um, so I'll try to, to keep this. You can try now. OK. Now it's on. Um, there you go. So this, this as I said, this will be very, very general. I won't go into, into any, any details. And I will only go through very, uh, very, um, um, yeah, give me a, a very brief overview of everything that involves the, this wildlife trade. Um, most of us, when, when, when we think about wildlife trade, we immediately think about uh, ivory, we think about rhino. Currently, there is lots of, um, lots of research being conducted on, on, on pangolins or lots of news in yeah, newspapers and, and, uh, and others about uh, um, other venues about, about pangolins. Um, and, and in fact, wildlife trade is, is uh, one of the major threats to, to biodiversity in, in, certain, in certain groups. In mam many of the of, of mammal groups, many bird um, for many bird taxa, it's one of the most one, one of the major major threats. Um, but uh, uh, this is only the most visible component of wildlife trade because in, in fact most of the trades. Of, of the trade at the global level is, is made on, on plants on, on plants and, and invertebrates, which are often neglected. Um, and we have, we have published um, a recent uh, analysis on um, trying to figure out what, 
what's the number and percentage of, of species that were, were traded, not necessarily um, threatened by trade, but that were traded at, at, the, at the global level. And we use the, the, um, the database from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is incomplete, but we already uh, uh, we already um, were able to to look at some some of the trends, um, and and if in absolute numbers, yes, it, it's true that most of the species which are listed there as being traded are are in in, in vertebrates. Um, when you go to percentages, then there are other groups which are quite quite important. And here, for example, you can see the, this four percent for uh, invertebrates here, represented by, by a butterfly. Um, this four four percent. If you think that uh, that invertebrates should should be orders of magnitude more species, also has, should have orders of magnitude more species than 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 vertebrates. Then these these species numbers, uh, if they if they were complete, would in fact be much much larger. The problem is that we don't have the the data yet, even for the in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature database, uh, only a very small fraction of uh, of uh, um, um, of, of insects are uh, are, uh, um, are are assessed. So the trade does does involve many other groups besides besides vertebrates and and um, in fact most of the trade currently is on uh, is on plants, namely for timber. Um, and this this is uh, um, this also reflects what's what uh, what. Um, I was saying, although uh, vertebrates are the ones which are more uh, more known in terms of what what's happening uh, uh, with them, which species are are, are traded, uh, the trade in, in fact uh, involves many many uh, other groups. Um, we 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 try to to summarize much of what uh, what was happening ar around the globe uh, in this uh, other publication, the, the scientists' warning. Um, on illegal and unsustain unsustainable wildlife trade, um, and we have seen that were eight uh, eight um, consequences of the of the wildlife trade, uh, because when when you trade the species, not only affecting the species that is being traded, but you're, you're going much further than that. Um, obviously, this is the most obvious uh, impact. Many many species are are traded for the food or derived products, for example, for meat or for or for for, for timber. And uh, as I said, the trade uh, in timber, uh, even of protected species, and much of it illegal, is is quite uh, quite massive uh, across uh, across the world. But we also have pet ownership, for example, this tarantula. In fact, uh, the the main expertise in 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 my group is around this. Uh, uh, these arachnids. So you have um, hundreds and hundreds of species of, of, of tarantulas being traded globally for, you know, for uh, just just to be pets of uh, usually of uh, in, in mostly in, in Central Europe for some reason there is a fascination for uh, for 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 tarantulas. So many people have have these uh, have these animals as, uh, as as pets, but of course it's not only tarantulas. I mean, you can everything that you can imagine. Someone will have it as a pet, even yeah, even the yeah, uh, weird the weirdest snail or yeah whatever you can think. Someone will have a, a, a taste for it. Touristic exploitation uh, also it's it, it, it's relatively large in some areas or even for for medicine you just have to think about yeah all the for example the the, the uh, oriental medicine or yeah pangolin scales or rhino horns or tiger uh, tiger bones and and so on um, can also think about yeah, mushrooms or many plants which are used for uh, for for medicine and of course it has large consequences direct consequences on the um on 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 the, on the species which which are traded so you have population depletion that's this is the most the most obvious but but also uh, if you target uh, individuals with certain with certain traits for example if the if elephants with the larger tusks are the ones targeted then you'll have demographic and you'll have genetic changes um sometimes uh, the the um, there are shifts towards alternative targets. So if a, a species is not is uh, uh, so rare that it's not not, not possible to, um, it's not really uh, it, it's hard to 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 get a hold of it. Then 
many uh, many uh, traffickers or poachers will uh, will um, turn to uh, alternative uh, species. Um, and the big problem is that we usually don't have any measures for sustainability. So how how what what are the consequences to this to these species if we extract the individuals from 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 the wildlife? Usually we we it's just we don't have the means to, to measure what's what's happening to the populations in uh, in the wild. Those, of course, it's not only the target species which are affected. Just think, for example, about um, about fisheries. Uh, if you uh, when 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 you fish for some for three or four or five different species, uh, then there are lots of uh, of other species which are caught on the, on, on the net. So this is usually uh, uh, by uh, yeah there are large portions of of bycatch. Um, you can also think about uh, about deforestation. If you cut a forest for for some some rare uh, timber, then of course it will affect every every species that was depending on 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 on, on this on this forest and uh, and so on. So you're always talking about cascading effects in a, in, in in these networks. We're talking about co co extinctions. Um, that that um, uh, when when one species goes extinct, then many species. Uh, that are related that depend on these species will will also go extinct. The spread of infrared species is also quite quite critical. When you move one species, you traffic one species from one place to the next, then maybe uh, it, it will it will be released released in the wild. Uh, for example, a pet. For many people, for example, have um, um, have um, snakes or. Yeah, uh, as pets, and then when they you know, are too large, then they release them into the wild, uh, and then of course it will have it will have consequences on on the uh, because the, the they are not not uh, natural in in in, where, in these places where they they are released. So the 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 ecosystem uh, will will suffer from uh, will often suffer from from it. So you can have predation, you can have competition. Or you can have hybridization if you, what you are releasing into the wild uh, is is uh, uh, is close enough to the to the native species to uh, uh, to to create uh, some some genetic genetic mixture, and this will both have direct impacts on species and of course habitat degradation. This this one, for example, this this plant here. Oops, sorry, this this plant here on 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 the right. This is really really common in 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 the source. It comes from the Himalayas, um, and it was first used as an ornamental plant. But now it's everywhere, and it's just destroying all the native forests. Uh, it, it's really affecting. And it's impossible to get rid of it. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem uh, when when the, these species, which were once traded for several different reasons, they are released into the wild, and then. Uh, the, the consequences can be can be enormous. All this will will lead to loss of ecosystem services. From you, know, you, you lose uh, you lose provisioning services, which are the ones related, which uh, are directly used by humans. Uh, regulating services which maintain the balance in the in, in the ecosystem, supporting services which are the ones that uh, that um, create the conditions for other species to, uh, to to survive, and then cultural services. So you you might be losing some non-material uh, non-material benefits if you lose some some species due to uh, to to the trade, or if it, your ecosystem is changed due to to um, uh, to, to to this uh, um, um, to this trade. During the last years, of course, we have uh, we have um, heard a lot about uh, about about COVID, which in fact it's it's not sure yet. It's always uh, yeah, it's it's still contentious if it was really caused by um, by uh, uh, some some kind of. Uh, there have been several hypotheses that that it, it came from from bats through pangolins it, uh, that that uh, that were and uh, that were being sold in in some markets in 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 China and and so on. So it's not really certain, but it is certain that many of the of the current infectious diseases outbreaks do have zoonotic origins and are due to, of course, to to to, to the trade within or 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 across. Uh, or across borders. This 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 is the big big um, 
the um, animals are many many animal groups are big reservoirs of uh, of uh, of um, organisms that can cross the barrier to humans and then create uh, major major problems as we have seen with uh, with covid-19 um and uh, this this is is, is probably uh, an effect that was not uh, many times people didn't realize that was uh, that was a, a, co a possible consequence because it's not certain uh, of uh, of wildlife trade. Um, obviously, we, we we often we talk about criminal networks. The trade by uh, of, of wildlife can can be done by by single individuals, which don't have that much uh, that much uh, power on their own. But many times, in fact, it, it is made by by criminal networks, which uh, which also trade on on drugs and uh, and weapons. Um, and uh, and and for example, there there is uh, there is evidence that the Taliban are partly uh, partly um, um, sponsored by uh, timber trafficking. So it's one way of, of getting getting the money. There are many many of these uh, uh, of, of of these cases. I mean, if you are if you are dealing with uh, uh, with, um, with with drugs or or some some other kind of, of traffic that you might uh, as well also also. Um, also trade some yeah some some animals or or, or animal parts um this will have effects obviously in, in local uh, local economies just you, you just have to to think that much of, of this this trade depends on large scale forestry or, or unsustainable fisheries or uh, there's even this the case of trophy hunting which is quite quite con contentious many many people now there is a big movement to ban trophy hunting but in fact it can be beneficial in in many cases so it's uh, yeah it's a uh, you have to really consider exactly what trophy trophy hunting uh, entails, in, in but in, in any case, all this um, uh, there, there are consequences, really strong consequences in, in in many local local uh, um, uh, economies. Uh, there is a, this curious example of this social degradation, and and again going back going back to my my tarantulas, it, it, it is quite common then that, that the poachers. Go, for example, to, to Brazil, uh, and they, they are usually they usually come from Germany, Poland, or Czech Republic. These are the three big countries in 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 the trade of uh, of not not only uh, arachnids but also reptiles, for example. And they just go to to Brazil or other countries, and they pay the, the children to to get them the, the tarantulas and other animals, like one dollar per each for each specimen. And so yeah, there, there are many, many children engaging in poaching because I mean it's a it's a good source of money, easy if they know where where the spiders are or where the lizards or snakes are or or whatever. And obviously this all adds up to effects on the on the global uh, global economy. Uh, if you're talking about uh, illegal trade, this is all parallel uh, to 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 the uh, to the regular uh, economy. So there are major loss of of, of of GDP. Of course, there is a major reduction in fiscal revenue. If you take into account also the ecosystem services, so think about all the services that a, a forest or many species uh, uh, provide to humanity, then this is basically. Uh, yeah, goes to trillions of uh, of dollars every um, every year, uh, and this this is um, this was in fact already calculated, um, taking into account these ecosystem services, and uh, if you um, and mo most of it, uh, most of these losses due to the loss of carbon sequestration services due to the to uh, many large forests being uh, being cut for uh, for timber, and much of it is uh, either illegal or uh, un unsustainable, and of course disruption to global economy, economic stability as we have seen with 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 COVID, uh, but not not all not all is bad. In fact, we. we we are always thinking about uh, about solutions, uh, obviously, or about ways to um, to make trade sustainable uh, and uh, and to make trade uh, as or to to create uh, legal options, legal alternatives to, um, to 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 the trade. And again, this was this was recent, recently published a global overview uh, on on the challenges and also the. Uh, some some possible solutions on on illegal and unsustainable trade, and many different options uh, exist from from bans and quotas. Bans usually they don't work that well uh, because everything goes goes to yeah to uh, to um, um, to the to 
instead of being open, everything goes goes to yeah to a, a much more concealed. The trade becomes much more much more concealed, much more hidden. But it doesn't really stop in in many cases. But in 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 some cases, as an emergency break, it does it has been proven uh, effective. Or if you are uh, many times, and it's the best example probably is for fisheries, uh, you can also establish quotas for the sustainable use. The problem is to get the data that really tells us, okay, this, this is how much you can take from nature without really affecting the species, without affecting the populations, the entire ecosystem. And usually I think this kind of data is really, really hard. And obviously because this has uh, large economic implications then, um there are always uh, always ways of of um, um yeah um, uh, messing with the data until yeah um, torturing the data until it uh, it gives us the answer we we want but if we are care careful then it, it is possible to 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 have robust data and uh, and to establish quotas for the sustainable sustainable use of um, uh, of many uh, of many species uh, protected areas uh, are quite uh, quite uh, important uh, in, in 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 many cases. Uh, they they do establish um, usually stricter rules on how you can use the, the resources inside uh, inside these areas. Uh, the um, the certification of legality and sustainability of of, uh, of the trades is usually is quite 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 effective to um, many of, of the products that that we uh, that we, we we buy. You could probably see many of these uh, these products with with some sustainability label on them. For usually for chocolate or for coffee or something like that. Many of them come with the sustainability uh, label. Um, if it's well, if it's properly used, then uh, it can be uh, it can be quite. A, Quite, uh, quite effective, and of course, captive breeding to to meet the demand. This is this is very very common. For example, for the for the pet market, many many pets are just bred in captivity, uh, and then and then and then they are sold. Uh, so you, you sell these these ones with these individuals which are bred in captivity instead of the ones taken from from the wild. Many technological advances have have been been made. Um, but the, the new tools in, in terms of DNA to identify what's being traded, for example, are already being being used in some cases in at at at, um, uh, at, at borders and in airports, uh, for for example. Um, image technology to, to detect uh, poachers it, it's it's also being being used. We are using web scrapping tools to see when something is, is being traded in in, uh, um, in, in, uh, in in real time. So whenever a shop is selling something that should not be there, then we we, we are already developing tools to um, to alert us that something is happening that should not be happening, and and so on. So there are many many options now in in terms of technology that we we can use. Obviously, awareness and education is really. Uh, really important, particularly for the local communities, uh, make them understand that some of the training is not sustainable, and it, it will uh, it will be it might be good and on the short term, but in the long term, they'll have to look for for options and will try to create um, uh, alternatives for uh, uh, as a way to to, to earn money. Um, Many regulation enforcement measures are, are being taken both at national level but also international level, like like uh, like uh, CITES, which is the conventional um, that is a, a global convention on on what is being traded and and, uh, and where it basically um, the idea is to is to either prevent or track what's being traded across borders uh, uh, in the entire world, although its effectiveness is sometimes put um, um, uh, put in, 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 into question. Obviously, we still have many knowledge gaps, particularly for those those groups that uh, that uh, are usually neglected. We still don't know much about what's being traded, for example, for invertebrates, uh, which species are being traded in what in what amount, and of, as, I, as I mentioned, what what are the consequences to the to the to the to their uh, wildlife um, populations. Um, uh, we, there are many tools also for to engage the local communities, including including social media, uh, and so there, there are many many options right right now that that we are trying to develop. But of course, the number of uh, the number of, of us 
wildlife biologists working on this, you can count, yeah, in, in, yeah, in just a few hands, maybe not, maybe a few hundred people working on this at global level. So we are not really not, don't really have much, much power, but we are, we try to do what, what's possible with the, with the tools available. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro, for this very informative and interesting presentation. So now we, I think we have like some minutes for the discussion. If, if now anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and, and present your question or comment. Okay, uh, then I maybe would start. So I have one, one question. So you, you presented several like solutions, what to do, but how do you see what is the, what, what would be the biggest option? I think I lost him right now. That was a bad timing. It was a very bad timing. Let me see if I can help him to re return. I, it doesn't seem to be coming back for the moment. Shall we then? I he is back. In the yes, room. sorry. I I think my internet connection was bad. So did did you hear my question or no? Uh, my no, question. No, no. Was, no, you didn't hear. So my question was. Uh, you presented several like uh, solutions to the current situation or current trends. So, what would be the biggest obstacle to carry them out effectively? This was my, my question. Uh, de depends on the, the solutions we are talking about, because we are we are talking about legislation, talking about technology, or talking about education. So, and each one will have its own uh, its own obstacles. Uh, it's it's not not really well. The, the first one. That always comes comes to mind. Obviously, is the, the lack of resources. Usually, wildlife trade is is seen even if it's a major. I mean, as 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 I, I have presented, it has major implications at the global level, even for the economies. It's always seen like a, a poor, a poor uh, um, uh, child of this trade. I mean, it's much more money is poured into drug trafficking or weapon uh, weapon trafficking or or whatever uh, obviously human human trafficking for for all of you for the obvious reasons and even if, if it might be um, many times I think the, the authorities don't consider it to be as important and as the other types of trafficking so it's there is there are not many resources put in 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 in, in into wildlife wildlife traffic um yeah it's um I, I think that that probably will explain much of the many of the of the, op, the obstacles the lack of awareness how how big in fact this is yes thank you so any other question? We could take one more question before we go to the next presenter. No? Okay, so you, you can also ask questions in the end. So if we have time. So, but now let's go to the next presentation. So uh, Luis Reino is going to talk about uh, networks of global bird invasion and a um, couple of words about Luis at first. So Luis is a researcher at University of Porto. He's mostly an ornithologist with expertise in ecology, ecological modeling, farmland ecology and invasion science. Um, and uh, his presentation is about how the international commerce of wild birds may potentially increase the invasion of risk of new species and how Europe, European Union ban on imports of wild caught birds 
has impacted the global trade of wild birds. So, Luis, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Indrik, and thank you for the opportunity. Can I share my, my screen, please? Yes, so Francesco. Yes. Okay, so let's move. Um, a short introduction, though Pedro has made a lot of introductions of the subject. Uh, so my, my talk will be pretty much focused on birds as an example. Uh, um, but in fact, it's not the most serious problem when you are uh, considering invasive species, both in economic impacts and even ecological. But uh, it's a serious threat for some species. As you can see, the international commerce uh, is pretty much like that. So it's very easy to pack and to use small cages, uh, hundreds of birds like parrots, but also small passerines even if a lot of them will die, both suppliers and demanders will make some money. Uh, all of these pictures, except the one on the middle and, and on the bottom, were taken from the internet. But when I was living in the US, I was really surprised that in the border between California in the US and Baja California, in Mexico, in the second most busiest um, land border in the world in, in, near San Diego and Tijuana. Uh, it was a, probably a Mexican guy trying to sell some parrots without any preoccupation to tourists, probably most coming from America, though all the law enforcement and surveillance around. So I was really surprised, but this was before the avian flu and the European Union ban. Um, as Pedro said, so there is uh, quite a link uh, between several species that are threatened and the international commerce. This is the case of the gray parrot, Psittacus ziritacus. It's a very appreciated bird. It's very expensive. It's very beautiful. It's very bright. And unfortunately for them, the red tail feathers are very appreciated for witchcraft ceremonies across the globe, including as far as in Brazil. This is a West African species. Most of, uh, uh, of the population of this species has been threatened by the destruction of tropical forest. It's a, a tree dependent bird, but also by the international commerce. But I will get back to these species later on. And um, the international commerce may also affect species that are not threatened, but may become threatened in the, in the future uh, because uh, they are uh, sometimes are species that are appreciated because they are rare, they are confined to specific habitats, to specific uh, regions like the top of the mountains, or they are endemic, for instance, from islands. This is the case, for instance, of these Ecletus parrot, par parrots. And sometimes, indirectly, the international commerce may be affected by the introduction of other species. This is the case of the famous Chapman uh, black robin from uh, uh, the Chapman archipelago of New Zealand. Uh, that uh, was affected in the past by the introduction of the European starlings, probably introduced by the naturalization societies in the 19th century in the former European colonies, in this case in New Zealand, by a naturalization society from UK. And this species was also affected by the introduction of plants that changed the natural habitat of this uh, archipelago. And so in the 90s, this species got a very low population level, just about six to seven birds. The, the New Zealand Wildlife Service rescued this population with a huge amount of money and effort. They saved the species, but most of the birds that are uh, alive today, about 200 birds, are descended from this female known by the old green, and this, of course, could be a bottleneck in the genetic point of view. And sometimes history, regional conflicts, um, commerce, etc., uh, meet specific uh, um, uh, species that 
are being traded and may be, become exotic. This is the case of the famous uh, uh, common wokspill. It's a small African pessary that was introduced in several islands like Hawaii in US, Brazil, Cape Verde, and in Iberian Peninsula in the 60s, initially in Portugal mainland, in mainland Portugal, sorry. And the fact is there is a link between the introduction of this species and its abundance in the former Portuguese colonies and the Portuguese colonial war. So the Portuguese colonial war in Africa started in 61 and uh, ended up in the 74. And this is a very common bird, it's very cheap. And due to the intense commerce of goods, military personnel and people, civil, civilians, um, probably this species was uh, um, very traded and it became introduced in Portugal in the 60s, as I told you before. And the situation nowadays is that this species is naturalized in Portugal and in Spain, and if he has opportunity, may further expand to other European countries. So uh, this is, uh, again, our geopolitics, trade, uh, etc., cetera, may, may change the composition of uh, an ecological community and a country. Well, but uh, what are the relevance? Well, there are a, um, a lot of things that Peter already uh, said, but of course, international commerce may be indeed a driver of species extinction, they may promote in the most serious problems the spread of invasion alien species. This means that invasion of alien species may have ecological, economic, and even health issues for both human populations or animals or plants or and other animal uh, and other species, and uh, the disease to both humans and animals, like Pedro Rip already said, uh, the case of SARS-CoV and all the doubts that we have been discussing the last years after the pandemic. So common solutions, well, different bands. For instance, in the 90s, the US applied a specific band, not sure if only for birds, but related with conservation issues and the famous European Union ban that uh, was made effective in 2007 and was related not to conservation preoccupations, but due to the avian flu at that time and specific regional or national legislation like the Decreto Real, Royal Decree in Spain that targeted specific species like specific parrots that now are not uh, allowed to be sell in pet shops. Main criticisms, well, big trade, blanket trade may increase sometimes illegal activities. They are often imposed by northern and rich to southern and poor countries and may run counter to values of equity and sustainable development. Well, we specifically in this study, we try to understand how the European ban have affected or not the flux, the even flux across the globe. So we try to, 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 we, we compiled all the information about the naturalization and, and establishment of avian species across the globe before and after the ban. You have the data for about 20, 10 to 20% of the species that are in cities repositories that are not all the species that are traded, some species that are, because in cities you just have species, generally speaking, that are conservation issues and so, the data, uh, there are restrictions, but there are species that uh, are traded that are not compiled by cities itself. And so um, there is this issue on our study, um, but the data overall are dominated by two avian orders that are the passeriforms, passerines, and the psittaciforms, parrots and islands. And so we split the data between before and after the ban, and you analyze this uh, with specific models, we're not going to the details of that. So in these maps, you can see that before the ban, so up to 2005, about 70% of the avian fluxes were between Africa and Western Europe. 
But after the ban, this changed considerably. And you can see that now the patterns and dynamics of the avenue flu fluxes are more diversified. If you see on the graphs on the left, on the top, if you see um, the, the overall trends that basically after 2005, the fluxes decreased dramatically. Mostly for passerines, for the parrots, the situation was not so serious because they have extra value and the market um, was able to adapt. In this map, you can see for the passerines that are more common and are cheaper, most of the international commerce were between Western Africa and Europe and for countries like Portugal, Spain, Italy, France, uh, etc. Um, for the Paris, the situation is, was more diversified and is still today. So there are other important apps like in Japan, South Africa, um, in Americas. And uh, this uh, was important for the su survival, let's say like that, uh, of the stakeholders involved with the trade uh, of parrots and owls. So getting back to the gray parrot, the you can, this is the how oh, the patterns uh, of trade for these species changed across time. Here for the legal birds, you can see that around 2005 there was a dramatic change and drop of um, of the number of, of birds traded for these species, uh, and for Europe now it's absolutely residual. But this doesn't mean that these species is not traded anymore. In fact, uh, this species is traded, it's still very expensive. I remember that I found a bird before the ban or around the ban, I don't remember now, now exactly. I, uh, I spotted a bird uh, uh, in the Lisbon area in Portugal that costed more than 1,000 euros. So in a normal uh, um, uh, pet shop in a shopping center. So it's really expensive. And now most of the birds that are supposedly legally um, on pet shops in Portugal, they are, um, they are uh, the result of breed in captivity. Here in Northern Portugal, there are, for instance, one stakeholder that are working on that. So this still is uh, a, a potential issue, but the situation from the what, for the conservation point of view, it's, it's improved. But as you can see still, uh, the, it seems that now, uh, not now, but recently, there are always some delay uh, on the data that is available on cities. So you need, you need to be a little bit conservative in looking for these figures. Uh, but it seems that for other regions, uh, the, the, the the importations of these species peak again around 2015. Uh, for the illegal, uh, the, the, it was important, the, the trade ban, all right, but the, the, the species is, team, is still being um, um, sized on airports and uh, all the, all, all the, and other um, um, places and so, and so there are still some issues like in Africa and Asia. Well, this is just to show how the results uh, in maps of our models. Before the ban, you can see that uh, we used the, uh, some network recovery aids and the quantity of number of birds uh, traded at the global level. You can see that before the ban, it was clear that a very strong link, link between the quantity of birds traded and the introduction or the events of introduction of birds at the global level. This changed a bit, of course, the quantity is still important, but now other metrics are playing a more important role at least until 2012. So mapping the invasion risk, you can see that before the ban, specific areas like Western Europe, Japan, South Africa, North America in general, um, have a, a very high invasion risk. And after the European ban, this changed a bit for Europe, but at the expenses of other regions, for instance, maybe in Asia. And it seems that the US now has a more uh, higher risk of invasion risks due to the trade. Well, main conclusion. So there is a link between 
the global trade in the international commerce of birds, and this should be also true for other organisms and species that we can introduce and later establish. Of course, the, 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 the European Union ban provoked a drastic drop of the number of birds traded globally, but at expenses of other countries, probably sometimes with more biodiversity interests and risks because sometimes they are tropical and this may be a very important issue in the future. Uh, and so this is uh, some of our works with my colleagues um, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, just, uh, I have first a question. Uh, I wonder uh, if, if I think about how these birds illicitly are transported, are uh, somehow uh, traded. Uh, is it easier to, I, I, I wonder how they are transported in general. Is it easier to detect this illicit trade in birds compared to illicit trade in drugs, for example? How do you see this uh, difference here? Well, with the birds, with what? Uh, for example, compared with drugs. Ah, drugs. Okay. Yeah. Well, it seems yes. In the in the Lisbon International Airport, uh, that is a very busy airport in Europe, and mostly with Brazil and Africa, with a lot of international flights. Sometimes you see here in the news that are pe people trying to smuggling parrots, eggs on the coats and things like that. So some are discovered, but others not. And uh, of course, sometimes there are uh, smugglers in the borders themselves uh, at the customs. So uh, it's possible, it's not impossible. Um, maybe you are thinking as a normal person, <laughs> and so, but there are always uh, ways to, to trafficking and smugglers. Uh, birds and uh, it's not just birds here i am talking about birds of course live organisms but sometimes it's in the in the wildlife it's in the case of birds eggs uh, it can be feathers skins uh, bones uh, well it's if you go to to um, uh, to cities you can see how, how variable and, and how diverse is the things you may uh, buy or, or not uh, through uh, using just wildlife. Okay. So, uh, any other questions or comments from for, for Luis? No, some kind of noise. <laughs> I have one, one additional question. Uh, can you? What do you think? What is uh, like um, the most crucial like research gap in this area, in your opinion? So, for example, what would we know uh, quite a lot, but what is uh, area that we actually would? Need to know more about in this in in your field, basically. Well, one of the issues I don't know if Pedro agrees. Uh, I have a more limited vision of this issue, but um, we don't know everything about the fluxes. And just now about uh, in the case of birds, uh, you just have access to data of 10 or less than 20% because, because, because some species that are not threatened in the wild, like the miners that are similar to, to starlings, they are very invasive uh, and we don't know the numbers that are being imported or exported. At the, even if I want to, to discover the numbers of birds, for instance, for Iberian Peninsula, it will be very difficult to find these results. Uh, and so uh, sometimes the species that are more relevant, not for, for the conservation point of view in the native areas, 
are traded easily, but they may become ex, uh, um, invasive in the in the, the new reception countries, and so the sometimes uh, you should so maybe cities should change a bit, or at least another body of UN or whatsoever, to that the will be mandatory to 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 have the fluxes of the species that on the native regions are not uh, threatened, but they may pose threats for the reception countries, like uh, for the miners, for instance. Yeah, I may add that yeah, I, I agree. The lack of information on uh, the fluxes is quite critical. Which species are being traded from where to where? Uh, and in, in that, uh, we have two major databases, CITES and at the global level, and the LEMIS database for the US, which is also quite, we use it quite quite a lot. Um, but uh, unfortunately, for example, the European Union is a complete no man's land, no law. I mean, you can import everything you want and nobody cares. Uh, in contrary, for example, in the US, you have, you have the, the Lacey Act. If it's illegal in the country of origin, it's illegal in the US. In Europe, once it crossed the borders, everything is legal, and it automatically has a stamp of yeah, okay, no problem. Now you can sell it. Uh, so something has to change. European Union sometimes is so proud of being in front of yeah, um, so so far ahead in many things, but in the case of wildlife trade, it's yeah, it's uh, very very badly managed. Everything at the European Union level, so we have no idea what's coming in and no idea what's being sold and what's legal, what's illegal. So, yeah, I, I guess there are many, yeah, many people who could help us here, or I, I, I hope in, in the future to try to cover these yeah, legal gaps and, and so on. And Thank just you. to add something, and sometimes you have the bizarre situation that uh, like the royal degree in Spain that targeted specific species like parrots, some species, that uh, they are, they cannot sell anymore in Spain, but they just can cross the border uh, to Portugal and buy it easily. And so, and probably it's not forbidden to take the animals uh, to Spain uh, easily. So there are these kind of situations that needs regulation. Uh, but uh, so it's a little bit stupid that a single country, even if it is a good measure, adopts a very restrictive law enforcement but thereafter people just can go to the the next border the next neighborhood and it's done so it will be better to do this uh, at the european level rather than applying a specific law because in the end it will not work okay we have one question in the chat this, although this is for everyone but maybe pedro and luis can answer so why, why do you think the European Union has less of an interest in monitoring compared to the US? No idea. Many countries and different interests. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I, I don't know what was the, the, Lace, yeah, the, the Lacey Act and Islamist database, they, they were established. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure when. Uh, maybe Luis has an idea, but probably in the 70s or 80s. But I, I don't know what was behind it or yeah, why it happened in the United States and not and, and not in European European Union. It, it, we don't even think about it. You know. Yeah. Uh, I can give you an example that is, of course, it's just an example. The countries here are not. Uh, um, it's, I will give you, it's a case of the American mink that is used by fur in Europe. It is an exotic species in several European countries, including in Portugal and Spain. And the, due to, to the impacts that this species is posing to, including in the East, the European mink, this species is not present in Iberia, but in, it is present in, at least in Eastern and Northern European, but I don't know exactly, maybe Pedro knows a bit, a bit, a bit better of this species. But Portugal tried to impose a ban to, at the European level to this species, but other European countries disagree 
because they have economic interests. Uh, you may find which uh, countries uh, tried to do that and they were successful. This is just to answer you that sometimes is difficult because one country, in this case, Portugal and Spain, for instance, have an interest that maybe, maybe came, um, may, may, may provoke not just ecological but economical issues, but other because they are they have an extra value in terms of the exploitation of these species in farm conditions. They disagree, and so you cannot do anything in this case. I think this may reply a little bit why it's so difficult, not just in, in case of, uh, of wildlife trade, but in other, in other steps of our lives, and sometimes mm -hmm. even more important, uh, to have an European deal in this kind of stuff. Hey, thank you. Now we have a couple of minutes left. If if now we have maybe for one question, time for one question. If anybody wants to ask the final question here. If not, uh, I think then we can call this meeting to an end. So thank you for everybody. Thank you for presenters. For presenting uh, the interesting work. So, and uh, let's meet in the next webinars. See you. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you.